Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, the 16th of August, 2016, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. I'm your host, Brian Gerrish, with me in the studio, Patrick Henningsen. Patrick, good as always to have you back. And um, you've been traveling. You've been overseas. You've been to Germany, Norway and to Russia. So I'm just going to cover the weather and then I'm going to say, tell us a little bit about your travels. Okay. Uh, well, the good news is the sun is shining here in uh, Plymouth. We've got yet another uh, summer's day. I did note this morning that a few leaves are beginning to fall off the trees. So that would be the fall in your terms or autumn in UK. And uh, we've been told that the weather's looking good in Pembrokeshire and other places. So we can afford to be pretty cheerful on that front, at least today. So you've been overseas. Um, where do you want to start, Germany or Norway or uh, Russia? It's, it's, it's interesting being on the continent, especially with all the news going on. Um, I was Part of my trip was I was doing research for a commissioned article on the migrant crisis and specifically about the string of so-called ISIS attacks in Germany, right. uh, train attacks and so forth. And so I was investigating that, and uh, I'll release a piece on that on my website pretty soon. But uh, what I found in my investigation was very interesting. Uh, we can talk about that later in the show, perhaps. Uh, Norway was fascinating. Right. Stopped by the Nobel Peace Prize Center. And uh, that was very interesting as well. I talked right. about that on my show, Brian. Oh, uh, well, that 21st century wire <laughs> was, was just quite incredible with those reports from inside uh, Syria. Yeah, yeah, it was um, very I th powerful. I think yeah. that made a big impact on, on a number of people. Yeah, it was, it was, it, it's, it's, it's one thing to uh, watch live. Um, correspondence on the mainstream media but when you have a chance to do it yourself with a small organization like ours yeah. uh then it's something else and, and you really can feel uh the importance of that reporting and and also what's going on uh, there was mortar fire and things like this yeah. uh, in the background so you know you worry about the safety of the people who are working or reporting there yeah uh, but we're lucky to be able to do that through cell phones and make connections uh, yeah. on the ground in places and it's it's yeah. real reporting because it's mm -hmm. coming in from it's coming in live on the ground and this can be done without um, millions of pounds worth of satellite gear now yeah and there's no producers no middlemen yeah. filtering or saying what uh, telling the policy people. is yeah yeah it's not happening it's just you know raw from the ground yeah. to me no middleman no no filtering nothing like that so um but uh but i uh, visited russia for the first time Beautiful city. I mean, very, St. Petersburg. Very impressive. Yeah. Very impressive. I mean, it just, uh, an, an, I, I had no idea how, A, how big that city is, and B, how old it is, and the different layers of history. Yeah. And uh, I, I want to definitely go back and visit it again okay. in the future, but I encourage people, it's stunning. Right. Really. In and Europe it, cities, I would say in the top, in the top five in the European cities. And, and this is part of the Russia that uh, Western media would have us believe is some sort of backward, uh, backward nation. No. <laughs> okay. Well, let's hop from Russia over to the States, because uh, this is the first uh, article that you've picked up on from the Los Angeles Times. And um, Donald Trump is, um, well, he's back on uh, security and terrorism, isn't he? Yeah, this is a big talking point. And if you speak to uh, especially people who are in the Hillary Clinton camp, this is one of the first things that Donald Trump's detractors will point to. And again, we see a renewal of this kind of call for a Muslim ban, although he's uh, sort of tweaked it now, recast it, as the headline says here, the LA Times. Uh, Donald Trump recast Muslim ban by calling for extreme vetting. What exactly is extreme vetting? Um, no one seems to know how long is a piece of string. The point with Donald Trump and all these crazy ideas that he keeps coming out with to get press media attention is that you can't have a, a ban on people of certain religions. A, because how do you do a religious test? You can't. B, it's illegal. It's constitutional. He would have to change the law yeah, in the United this. States. It's not going to happen. So how people are actually getting all bent out of shape about this it shows you how people in the media are following rhetoric, and we're trained now. The public is, yeah. this is a perfect example, Brian. They're trained to follow the rhetoric and not the substance of it. So you can argue all you want about Donald Trump and this, how horrible this would be, but it's not going to happen in the United States, not under the current governmental legal system. Right. They would have to fundamentally change 
pass constitutional amendments, which is not going to happen with the Supreme Court that currently sits. Yeah. So why everyone's got their uh, self in a twist over this is just shows you how kind of adolescent um, the media and the political process is becoming in America, yeah. which itself is, is that's more frightening than Donald Trump, okay. in my opinion. Right. Uh, what, what about Hillary? Because um, we got the two heads on that, uh, that screen there. I noticed that Hillary's in blue, uh, usually regarded by the Americans as the good guys. The blue forces are the good guys and the reds are the reds, of course. Uh, but Hillary Clinton, I've been seeing some very interesting little YouTube clips suggesting that her, her health is not good at the moment. Uh, there's one showing her having some sort of spasm in front of reporters. Uh, there's another one where she has to be helped up or down podium steps. Um, and then it's emerged that she's broken into quite intense coughing fits at several of the major talks. She looks pretty rough. Do you think there's any substance in this in claims that she's in very bad physical health? I've seen a lot of reports uh, going back to when she had the head injury, the concussion, yeah. allegedly during a plane flight. Uh, in December, then she went missing. This was two years ago, right. well, I think, while she was Secretary of State, I think. So it's ever since then, you've been seeing these sort of Hillary Clinton health scare reports. Yeah. I personally uh, don't see anything major right now to report on this. I see a lot of reports coming out of the sort of the usual sources from the other side. Um, but if you're, if you're wishing that uh, a health scare is going to derail the Clinton campaign, you, you, you'll be still holding your breath. Uh, till after she gets inaugurated in, in January. The fact of the matter is the one who's really looking worse for wear is Bill Clinton. Bill, yeah. And a lot of people have commented on this, not just uh, Republicans and uh, Trump supporters, but just generally I've seen a lot of people who have no stake in the game saying Bill Clinton looks like he has aged like uh, a lifetime yeah. in the last couple of years. And so there would be a big concern about his health. So there's stuff catching up on them from the past? I don't, I, I don't know, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, a lo it's a fast-paced lifestyle in politics in the U.S., okay. global, globetrotting, and I don't want to get into Bill Clinton's proclivities, uh, which are probably well-known, uh, yeah. at least in the alternative media, but uh, uh, certainly yeah, it could be a case of you know, the past catching up, as it sometimes does. Okay, well, presumably he won't be having a bomber care to sort him out. Um, <laughs> And on that subject, we'll hop, up, hop back to UK and uh, The Guardian here, which is suggesting, I, I found this, this um, uh, header quite incredible, feet first, our NHS is limping towards privatisation, to which I say, no, it's not. It, it's being driven towards privatisation at the speed of light. So is Polly Toynbee... Is she really up to date with what's going on, or is this spin? Well, go just flash up this Guardian article yeah. again. This is the problem with the Guardian in general. Is this this very subtle spin is applied to just about every issue? Brian, how many times have you seen stories spun in this very subtle way? What she's trying to say is this: Oh, we're we're heading into a crisis. The point is, uh, we listened to Radio Four, one of the major radio stations, this morning coming into work, Brian. And they're saying, oh, the waiting times for basic routine surgeries, it's just too long. And the, the, the government's no longer finding the NHS uh, re regional centers for late waiting times because of budgetary worries. So they're going to let the waiting queues extend. What is this just setting up for paying for fast track yeah, surgery? Yeah, if you're worried and you, you've got enough fear factor, then you're going to... Uh, you're going to pay on you to get yourself through the system. 150, 200 pounds, whatever they're going yeah. to charge. That's the beginning of privatization. But Brian, you've been saying this on this show for years. They have been nudging the NHS towards, uh, in large parts of it are already privatized, Brian. Huge parts. And of course, the other thing is that the NHS still has its uh, European office because it felt it was so important to um, retain uh, communications, this is their words, with the European supply market, that they, they had an NHS uh, office, a major office set up there some years ago. So don't be surprised so, if you're going to see these talking points now flashing on radio and on print, on TV. Yeah. Crisis. There's a crisis. They're pumping up this idea of a, of, of a crisis in the NHS. Meanwhile, they've never spent more money in this decade. Well, 100 billion is what's being pumped in. Than ever before. And yeah. to, to say that, oh, is this just because more people are using the service? No, because money is hemorrhaging 
out of this organization into consultants, private contractors, corporations. Locums, so temporary locums. staff coming in. Yeah. And, and this all, all happened, I think this really started in a big, big way under the Blair uh, ten, you know, 12 years of the Blair government. Well, um, on that theme, we just remind people, of course, that it is only the UK column that has been pointing out the penetration of common purpose into the NHS. And this fantastic article by Martin Edwards still stands because this has got the detail on how common purpose was put into the grain of the NHS. And then they have continually uh, pushed this corporate commercial agenda from inside the NHS uh, with one woman saying that what we need is a million change agents. Well, no, they don't. They need competent staff who are going to look after the um, the sick and the uh, uh, people who've got health problems. But what's gone into the centre of the management structure is, is an organisation which is pu pu uh, sorry, pushing commercialisation. I think the it's doing NHS a bit of a Hillary there. It, it's been earmarked yeah. for privatisation for a long time. Brian. Yeah. And, uh, and I think we're just starting to see the signs of that sort of... Well, it's just coming up to the surface. Taking shape yeah. now, yeah. Well, if we're worried about the um, NHS, we shouldn't be worried about Britain because apparently we're in the safe hands of um, Boris Johnson, you've discovered. Well, this is, this is a great feel-good story here. Uh, Theresa May is off on holiday. I'm not sure where she's gone, but I'm sure it's a nice sunny place. And Boris Johnson, so here's a, another headline in The Guardian. And again, I'm worried about The Guardian, Brian, is this is a non-story. Boris Johnson on standby? to lead the country while May is on holiday? Are we expecting, is there a crisis that's going to break out at the end of August here? And then we've got a picture of Boris. And quite frankly, he doesn't inspire a lot of confidence, Brian, no. especially with some of the things he's said. Well, he's only last... on standby to lead. They're not actually, to be fair to The Guardian, they're not actually saying he's capable of leading. <laughs> he's only on standby. But really, The Guardian, <laughs> Brian, to be, to, to be critical of The Guardian, they should be cr more critical of these ministers, of people like Boris Johnson, what are his credentials to lead the country? Well, he that's, that's what they should be asking. But there are, you, you'd be hard-pressed to find a writer at any of these newspapers that's really going to take the government to task. This is yeah. kind of new celebrity journalism with politics that's come in. Yeah. They're more concerned about what fashion they're wearing or what their hairstyle's like. Well, we're commenting on Boris's hair, but yeah. that's another story. But um, there's little challenge coming from the media. Uh, these days. They're shot. That's my opinion. They're anyway. shot. They're past it. Mainstream yeah. media is past it because uh, they either just don't report or they don't understand what they should be reporting. So let's remind ourselves of uh, what the Prime Minister is really about. Uh, and I think this is, this is key because it's uh, Theresa May that has installed this phenomenal state spying system inside UK. She is the woman who set it up. She now moves up in the post to Prime Minister uh, so she can start to enact this thing. So the inset there is a number of organisations which include uh, Met Police Security Services and some very interesting databases which are connecting uh, local authority information. Cameron, of course, was calling for more state spying power. So this was, this was uh, a historical call when Theresa May was Home Secretary. Uh, she set up the Prevent. So if we've got Trump talking about more extreme measures uh, to uh, counter the so-called terrorists, Theresa May went into the heart of the country with Prevent, which uh, police are themselves saying is helping to create uh, unrest and semi-terrorist thoughts. Uh, then we've got GCHQ doing a little deal with um, your guys in America, if I may say so. And uh, what are we doing? Selling data to the highest bidder. Uh, well, that's all pretty mucky stuff. And then it gets even more complicated because we've got Francis Maud and Letwin previously in the cabinet office who were doing deals with Israeli intelligence services, um, bringing them into partnership with um, GCHQ and, and British intelligence services themselves. So this is just an incredible network. And for anybody to now be looking at UK and saying we're still a democracy, this is, this is a joke. And what is this? This is actually the big society that Cameron's talked about. Yeah. We, we're only a small nation state, Patrick. When we, when we think of 
the population of America and the amount of land people are spreading. UK, we are packed in now. And the effect of this type of spying, I would suggest, is 10, 100 times worse in UK than it would be in America. Well, if you look at the per capita spending in a country like Britain on things like uh, surveillance, spying, and the pretext for this, of course, is, is terrorism for basically everything. This is the only reason they ever yeah. give for any program or any new sort of uh, budget item that's coming in or any new uh, thing like Pre 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 Prevent Strategy or the Channel Project, which was the predecessor of that yeah. with the Metropolitan Police. But it's always terrorism, terrorism, terrorism. The amount of money, the amount of resources, yeah. Brian. So you have all these other departments around the country, the NHS, and they're all in education. We're you know, scrounging for pennies. Uh, children don't have enough paper. Uh, they don't have the right computers. They're not being prepared for the next generation yeah. of technology. And yet, if you say it's for terrorism, if you yeah. say it has to do with uh, clamping down on terror, the money just appears out of thin air. Yeah. And they sign it right off. So this is what we've got. Um, and, of course, it's not going to be used to stop terrorism, Brian. Eventually, any state that erects this sort of apparatus will turn it on its own population. Yeah, absolutely. And members of government will turn it on the opposition, and they'll be all spying on each other, and everyone's in one office looking at the other person in the other office, tapping public officials, fear, telephone fear calls. Fear and suspicion. And, yeah. this, this is what happened with the NSA, NSA in America. There, this, this, you can, if you're in power, direct the NSA to tap the phone uh, of your opposition. Yeah. And so what are we left? That's a hugely dysfunctional democracy at that point. Yeah. Very dangerous and very expensive, and it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. Money, no object. Um, money, no object when it comes to conventional defence. So let's uh, bring in Russia because, of course, uh, the Russians have been accused of being backward, um, backward nation. They are the uh, nation that uh, spies on its own citizens. Well, we've just learnt something uh, about ourselves. But um, there's some big shocks to do with, Amer uh, with American perception now of uh, Russian military equipment. Yeah, and uh, you know, you go to any of these defense shows right now, and some of the, the big buyers are normally Arab countries. They're very interested in what Russia's got in their wares. So this is the new um, uh, Tu-22M3 backfire bomber. They're basing this in Iran, yeah. so the to do strikes on ISIS in Syria. So Russia's got incredible operability now um, on mainland Syria, Iran, Caspian Sea, um, incredible. And like their fighter jet, which was just unveiled the latest version, the T-50, Sukhoi T-50 stealth fighter, outperforming everything. Yeah. So this NATO does not have uh, military superiority uh, based on the equipment that we have on the NATO side. Yeah. And so what's going on? What's Russia's annual defense budget? 90, well, 90 billion. It's a fraction of, 90, fra fraction of the U.S. 90 billion. And the U.S. spends 600. That's just yeah. not including the black budget projects. 600 billion. Yeah. And how can Russia produce a fighter and a backfire bomber that outperforms and cruise missiles that outperform what the U.K., what the U.S. have? How is that well, my, my quick answer to how is because they have a... a defense spe uh, specification, they've then got a procurement system which is professional and does its job, and they carry on and work through the project, where in the West we, we've got uh, utter chaos in defense procurement to the extent that now in Britain we can't even build a fleet of ships that work in warm water. We so have, we have some... corporations bleeding the national budgets, um, co contractors bleeding national budgets with, with boondoggle projects, yeah. fighter jets that they promised they're going to do, go to Mars and come back. Um, and they're not living up to uh, their billing, basically. Yeah. Uh, F-35, perfect example. Um, total cost by the end of the day will be around a trillion dollars by the time the, uh, the first round of, of that rolls out off yeah. the assembly line. So um, over these years. So, yeah. So trillion, some, trillion dollars, trillion dollars. So some shocks here, and yet we're told that we need all of this spying, we need GCHQ, we need all of our spying capability to tell us what these what these people, the Russians, are up to, but we don't seem to be able to do that. Oh, ISIS we, is up to. Or, well, <laughs> well we, we, we're to believe they can tell us who's riding a motorbike in the middle of Syria, but they can't quite work out 
what Russia is doing with its defence budget. This is nonsense. Very interesting article here that uh, was passed through to us. Um, this is uh, from shtfplan.com. Uh, what I like about this article is it, it's got source material in it, uh, but it's basically saying that Russia's unveiled a secretive new technology that could give it the upper edge in clandestine operations and electronic warfare. Uh, electronic warfare is the key, and this article links through to this one from The Independent, where we've got uh, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, the commander of the US Army in Europe. He's described Russian advances in electronic warfare in Syria and Ukraine, a field in which they were typically supposed to be backward. I find that an interesting comment, but he says, well, now their performance is eye-watering. So this is, this is, in my mind, Patrick, a mixture of arrogance and sheer ignorance by uh, senior military people, because, of course, the moment you start to underestimate an adversary, the adversary's got the upper hand. Um, th this is incredible, really, that we're seeing, we're seeing uh, a West which says that its spying ability is second to none, but they don't know what the Russians have been doing. It's not only that, the, the, the minute you start intimidating your adversary unnecessarily, you're only motivating your adversary to come up with solutions to better uh, their, their other side, which is in this case would be NATO. Yeah. Um, but this, this, this is only begins here, Brian. We'll talk about China in a minute. Talk about eye-watering, uh, what the Chinese are developing yeah. right now in, in the terms of information warfare and information technology is unbelievable. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, well, let's uh, have a change of subject to the church. And um, what's the relevance of this? Well, a number of people have been uh, challenging the Church of England for simple non-performance in a range of areas. And uh, this is becoming of interest. We can actually contrast it with uh, President Putin at the moment, who in general seems to be standing up for the church in, in Russia. But what's been happening here in UK and uh, in particular, um, with regard to Archbishop Welby of the Church of England. And um, I'll just read you a little piece of this email. It says, Archbishop, it's becoming clear an un unworthy element has placed itself in British society to purposely harm our children and our Christian morals. In addition to the major networks of the sex abuse of children within our establishment, there are people who partake in satanic rituals abusing adults and children as a matter of course in these rituals. And um, in the email, it goes on to identify a number of cases that are reported. The aim of this is to say, well, this is not some myth. Let's look at cases that have been reported. Uh, so it's talking about Telford. Uh, it's talking about Liverpool. It's talking about Swansea. And it's talking about Truro in uh, Cornwall. And then it ends by pointing out that, of course, Satanism, Satanism has been approved in the uh, Royal Navy. Now, that is an interesting factor, if I just digress, because I picked up from the internet that uh, Satanism was approved in the US Navy back in 1976, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, the 70s, yeah. Yeah, which I didn't know at all. So there's a subculture within, within the military, within an institution like that, uh, Satanic subculture, yeah. I think. You call it a religion. Some people would call it a religion. I'm I'll call it a subculture, right? Um, a corrupt subculture. Okay, so um, so basically, we we've got people now saying that there's something deeply sinister operating in society, and um, that was just the end of it. I would like to know what measures you are taking to ensure the rise of Satanism is stopped. So you would have thought that the head of the Church of England would be quite interested in this subject and uh, would be responding. But the opposite appears to be happening, that we have Archbishop Welby running away, bringing the bankers. Um, so let's have a look at this. Now, this is going back to 2014, but I'm very grateful for the person who sent it through to us. It's the Church Times, and the headline is Plan to Groom Talent for High Office in the Church of England. So I've got, I've got a little bit of analysis on this, Patrick, but you pick up something just from that headline, don't you, that uh, we are going to groom people, interesting word, so that they're suitable to take up positions of high office. What do you think that means? Yes, identifying future leaders. So what is ta what, what's the qualification for being on the talent list? 
Yeah. This is the big question. What boxes must one tick next to their name to be considered talent worthy of grooming? Grooming, yeah. For leadership positions. Uh, that's actually the fundamental, that's what I'm interested in the answers well, to. Well, we, we can answer that partly but from a little bit of work that we've done here. But let's remember that it was David Cameron who said that people who were going to ha have a position of importance in the Conservative Party were going to do briggs Moyer psychometric tests so that they wanted to know about these people. So we saw that uh, within uh, the level, higher levels of party politics, we're going to have specially selected and groomed people. Now we can see this coming into the church. Well, who's pushing this in? Let's meet the man, because here he is, Lord Green, the former group chairman for HSBC Holdings, is the man leading this initiative in the church. Uh, they're going to spend, um, that should be two million, two million pounds, talent management budget uh, for the Church of England leadership initiative of 2014. So don't worry about the starving people. We've got a quick two million and it's going to be talent management for, you were right, future leaders and leadership development for bishops and deans. And what is all this going to do? Uh, we're going to be building healthy organizations, uh, leading growth and reinventing the ministry. So we've got a banker that's uh, helping the Church of England to reinvent itself. Do you, do you get a warm feeling from this? Not really, uh, considering the fact that most of the churches in this country are empty. Yes. Uh, so we have a country of empty churches. Uh, we don't have anybody practicing Christianity per se, very little, in fact, compared to the amount of churches. But then we have the church, which yeah. is an institution. Yeah. So no religion, really, per se, no faith, no attendance yeah. on Sunday, but, lo but a big institution. And this institution is very politicized. And very wealthy. And very wealthy and very much yeah. a part of politics uh, and, social, and the social entrepreneur aspect of it, which you talked yeah. about, very much goes in line uh, with some of these programs that we're describing yeah. here, financed by some of the, um, or staffed by bankers, uh, the connection yeah. God, banker. Yeah, religion, it doesn't fit too well, does it? Oil. Church with Welby as well, former oil executive. Yeah, That's absolutely. It's yeah. very interesting. But he, he was called to the ministry, but he's going to change the ministry. So let's have a look at some of the detail of this because it's it's remarkable. We've got reinventing the ministry and how they're going to do it. They're going to introduce culture change. Uh, what sort of change? Well, they're going to go for the common good. They're going to reshape the ministry uh, and they're going to lead the church for growth. I think I need a new pair of spectacles, actually, Patrick, because there's a typo there, and I didn't see that earlier, but we'll, okay. we'll carry on through there. We've got the DAG, the Development and Appointments Group. Uh, we've got the Talent Pool. Now, this is interesting. This is where they, whoever they are, are going to be looking at people in the church and selecting them. 150 high-potential individuals are being selected for an intensive five-year training. Wow, that's going to take you into uh, uh, Christianity and proper spiritual matters. They've got to show early promise, uh, exceptional potential. Uh, they've got to be ready now. So these are the key people. They're ready now. And they're also going to set up an alumni network to track these people. Uh, they're going to have a database, always handy. And then this will produce mentoring and coaching system for there we are future leaders this seems to me like a, a corporate a corporate sort of structure here social enterprise structure yeah. uh, what happened to seminaries and monasteries yeah there's no no mention here of the studying the spiritual uh, no literature guidance history uh, um being meek or um or looking after the sick and, the, and, and the, humble. Yeah, humble. No, yeah. this this is to do with international banking, but it's really the church. Uh, somebody's a little, a little bit ahead of us, actually, in the chat box, and I'll explain why in a minute. But let's just remind ourselves that um, the Archbishop is very good at hobnobbing with uh, bankers, whether it's Lord Green, or we've had reports here from the Ecumenical News where he was having a little social 
um, event with um, Mr. Carney from the Bank of England and... Uh, lovely Christina Lagarde. Yeah, Christina Lagarde. I believe that she's charged with some sort of fraud thing at the moment. Yeah, I can't I... imagine that the Archbishop knew that at the time. He was sat uh, next to her. She's not difficult to miss with that orange uh, skin tone. Yeah. So, not, so not there we Donald are, Trump's. the the man who's leading the nation spiritually, and uh, I just thought we'd bring in the basic thing, which was that Jesus said to his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. So I'm a little bit puzzled as to what, what's going on in Mr. Welby's head. But we notice he doesn't want to ask, answer any questions on Satanism. Now, uh, what that means, I don't know. I think they're planning for a lot of camels to be passing through the eye of the needle. Or the needles are bigger than they used to be. The, yeah, they've widened the needle. The widen, yeah. Yeah, that's probably it. Or the okay. camels are smaller. Maybe. <laughs> okay. Well, not to worry, because, of course, um, David Cameron said he was going to solve the problem. So let's bring in David Cameron. And this was the Independent reporting him some time ago because he called the police because nasty food bank campaigners were getting in the way of his uh, local constituency office. So that was a bit embarrassing. Uh, but what we're interested in here is that David Cameron said in the Church Times that Britain should be evangelical about its Christianity in a separate claim made earlier this month. He said that the Conservative Party's big society was continuing Jesus' work. Now, this is remarkable, isn't it, that we've got uh, basically Welby now working with the bankers to change the church. That'll be into big society. And I'll just bring in this comment here because, of course, David Cameron was singing, apparently, um, at the service where um, the Archbishop of uh, Canterbury, Welby, was, was present. So he's been there as a cheerleader. Uh, but let's just make sure people realise what's going on here. Uh, that David Cameron's big society is the work of Jesus. Um, I'm not comfortable about this at all, but um, just uh, bring in the other aspect. So let's, uh, here they are. Here's the bankers with the head of the Church of England. And of course, somebody started to mention Tony Blair. So we better bring in uh, Sandy Miller, Holy, Holy Trinity, Brompton, Nicky Gumble, And that leads us through to the Alpha Course. Uh, the, Alpha uh, the Alpha Course, Common Purpose for Churches, and here's the Tony Blair Faith Foundation in the middle of it. And, of course, he's another Christian. He's, he's done great Christian works right away across the world. And uh, we shouldn't forget this little organization buried in the background uh, because I think this is another key part of big society. Um, and what are they doing? They're transforming government and uh, structures. So no problems at all there. No, not at all. Well, there is one problem because uh, the church recently covered up uh, the exposure of this story. Teresa Cooper, who with other ladies was abused as a, as a young girl within the church care system. Um, it was reported in the mail. The church for years refused to acknowledge the abuse. Uh, pretty appalling. Uh, and then they announced, um, when did they announce it? Oh, they announced that. Uh, their, their guilt when uh, we had the Hebdo shootings. Conveniently buried under a mountain of headlines there. Yeah. And, of course, we've got the business that social services refuse to cooperate. Now, we've seen this sort of stuff in the States as well, Patrick, haven't we, that uh, fingers have been pointed, particularly at the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. uh, but also at uh, the U.S. government saying that child abuse is covered up. Why do you think this happens? Well, in, ter in, in terms of the Catholic Church, this is well documented. And uh, uh, in America, the big worry is liability and uh, lawsuits and the amount of money that would have to be paid out uh, right. if this went to trial. And also the tax-exempt status of churches. Uh, this institutions like churches uh, are all under fire, are all under pressure. And the government, there's a very strange relationship between uh, government and religious bodies. Uh, in the United States, a lot of it has to do with money, right? So uh, that's a big motivator uh, as to you know what what happens and what doesn't happen. Well, okay, let's um, just bring in this um, this lady, the Home Secretary Amber Rudd, because um, we're we're saying that 
there's still no proper response from her on the subject to the Metropolitan Police officer that blew the whistle on the cover-up of abuse, a child abuse by the British government, by senior police, by social workers, by local authorities, and by some of the major charities that claim they're there to help children. This, this is your angle. These people very frightened. Um, so what they did ask us is what time the policing minister, Mr. Penning, was mentioned in the audio. And uh, they weren't interested in the little girl uh, who was dead in the gutter. Um, so this is the quality of Britain's new Home Secretary. Uh, but this takes the biscuit. Now, I've decided not to give the name of the uh, press officer that I'm corresponding with, because I'm going to say I believe the individual's been quite fair with me at the moment. What I think is happening is that the poor old media team are being given the dirty job by officials in the Home Secretary, in the Home Office. Uh, but this was an email um, saying that um, the Home Office can't access the audio file. So they've said that they can't seem to get it to work if they go to the website. And I said, no problem, I'll, I'll give you a copy of the, um, of the audio. So I sent that over. And now they're saying that they can't actually open that audio file and they want a transcript. So I think this is what delaying tactics at the moment, do you think? I'm not sure, but uh, yeah, many, many other thousands of people have, have already listened yeah. uh, to this recording. But the Home Office, I think the Home Office employs about 15,000 people. I think that's the correct figure. But I'm not sure they, what's going on here. But it, They it, can't open a file. But you're being asked to perform a task, basically, is to generate a transcript right. of a fairly lengthy interview. And yeah. that will take you hours. Well, to do, unless you're very somebody fast very typer. kindly has done it for a, us. A and fast I, under typer. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that's already gone to the Home Office, uh, but I'll read this very quickly. I did send them a reply, and I think it's appropriate to read this out. Um, so, dear uh, Mr. X, I have received your email below and find your comments simply not credible. The audio of the interview with the Met police officer, police officer has been publicly available for over two weeks and has been accessed by hundreds of thousands of people uh, who are appalled to discover that senior professional people who have a direct responsibility for child protection have been covering up child abuse. Shocked feedback on this case has been received from police officers, legal professionals, child protection professionals, and many other members of the public who seem to have little problem listening to an audio interview. You now claim that the Home Office, with thousands of professional staff, is unable to listen to that same audio, and you now also claim that the Home Office is unable to listen to an audio tape sent to the Home Office directly. This is the same Home Office under Home Secretary Amber Rudd that claims it's using professional staff to investigate and bring to justice abusers of children. Clearly, this cannot be the case. Young children abused, neglected, and ultimately dead in the gutter and the Home Office has now spent days puzzled over how to access a freely accessible public recording. Can you please put me in contact with the Home Office person now responsible for this case? And I'll be happy to assist them further. So that was the challenge, uh, Patrick. Um, what are we going to get back from the Home Office? I think my, predi uh, my prediction is nothing, because they've got nowhere to go. Their backs are now against the wall. The lid has been blown. The British government is part of the cover-up of the abuse of children. And as I've said several times, the abuse is part of the blackmail of politicians to do the bidding of what those bankers may be. The, the, the one part about this story that hit me uh, really hard was uh, listening to the police officer. And not I had no idea of what the things that they have to go through and handle and deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. How you can do this for years on end, this job. Um, Without being damaged. Working in, in especially those types of cases, uh, that's a lot of stress. It's a lot of pressure. There is politics involved. And it goes right up the chain of command, as, as you've described here. That's an incredibly difficult job. Um, and I think if you are working and doing a good job in the department, you need more support. You need to support your colleagues. You need political support. Which, Otherwise, of course, this man didn't get. A t he didn't get any of that. Th then the system becomes dysfunctional if they don't have that support, yeah. because that is an incredible. That's the most difficult area to work in. The most difficult. Yeah, I would say 
in the top two of everything you can do in law enforcement. That has to be one of the yeah. most difficult areas. And to do that for you, two or three years, seven years, I don't know how many, how many cases they work on. And uh, hundreds. It's incredible. Yeah. You know, I, I had no concept of that before listening to that, yeah. that interview. Well, we'll wait and see what happens. But if um, viewers and listeners want to know what training our police are doing, what better place to go than have a look at uh, Police Scotland. And here we are. Uh, this was sent through to us. And it's the Police Scotland uh, Training Academy. So we passed the running challenge, uh, sorry, the running man challenge to our new recruits at the Police Scotland College. Uh, and they, did, they didn't disappoint. Um, so we've got a picture of uh, police recruits. And what are they being trained in to do the running man challenge? Is that like dancing? Uh, it's, it's some stupid dance that the police seem to be taking up wherever they wherever they choose but this is public money public time and police scotland that don't seem to be too good on pedophiles uh, can do running man is this is this a joke or is this real no this is real These this real is real patrick officers. oh this is real those are yeah. real police yeah. officers dancing and yeah. putting that out on social media yeah so my question is naturally brian does that inspire a lot of confidence no i i think that what we've now got is training reframing going on within the within the civil service, within the public services, which is reducing adults to childish antics. This is an attack on people's minds. It's certainly an attack on being professional. And let's contrast it. Mike brought this up. Uh, we've got this um, uh, former footballer uh, tasered and killed. Um, there we are, former Aston Villa footballer uh, Dalian Atkinson dies after being shot with a police taser. Uh, but we need to remind people that, uh, of course, Theresa May has been instrumental in making sure that police are armed with the taser. And here we've got the mail saying that children as young as 11 have been tasered. And uh, the statistics mentioned there, 323 under 18s were fired on tasered in 2011 alone. That is a pretty shock. I mustn't use that word. That's a pretty uh, a disgraceful statistic. Yeah, and the numbers, and, uh, the numbers in America are right through the roof as well. Indeed. Now, I'll add this to the, uh, to the slide here because somebody said to us, just remember that Taser is actually a brand name. So when the government uh, says that they're giving the go-ahead for the police to use Taser equipment, they're giving them unlimited powers of enforcement in terms of weapons. So this comment came in from a gentleman called Matt Waterman. The Home Department refused to respond to concerns and questions in that regard. And he also points out that Amnesty International uh, declared regular tasers a weapon of torture back in 2008. So we're unleashing a weapon of torture not on adults, on children. This, this is sick political uh, mentality, Patrick. I'm almost lost for words as usual. Well, the, the, the worst thing about the most oxymoronic, if not deceptive part of this story is that they use the term uh, non-lethal to describe these taser guns. Yeah. And with the amount of deaths uh, that we've had over the years, how can you call it non-lethal? Well, I, it, it can kill people. I have actually got a slide, which I'll bring up in a second, having a look at those threats. Uh, but just to emphasize the point here, we've got a report from uh, AB, uh, sorry, NBC News. Parents consider legal action after South Dakota police taser an eight-year-old girl. Uh, now this story is that this little girl had a knife. Uh, the police claimed that she'd cut her leg, and then she was holding the knife against her chest. So they decided the best way of disarming an eight-year-old girl was to taser her. Is this common sense, or is something else at work here? Uh, it's definitely something else is at work, not common sense. But a lot of strange things are happening in America with regards to law enforcement and uh, what they deem is to be the right course of action to uh, neutralize the threat yeah. or to de-escalate the yeah. situation. That eight-year-old um, girl, dangerous, yeah. dangerous threat. All too often, law enforcement's de-escalation involves escalation of violence yeah. and ends in death, in this case, many others. Right. Well, this is, uh, this is the sort of comment you get around the taser. Um, so. The beauty of tasers is that you don't need expert training. That's, that's quite a statement, isn't it? 
So these are some of the, the uh, things that have been flagged up as the dangers. Of course, if one of the barbs hits you in the eye, you're going to lose an eye. So there's a risk of direct physical harm, uh, but they can cause cardiac arrest or, or breathing can stop. And then we had the appalling case in Devon and Cornwall where the police tasered a man covered in petrol and he simply burnt to death. Uh, but the policeman didn't realise, you know, if you mix fuel with uh, high voltage electricity, you're going to get a problem. Um, but it doesn't matter because you don't need expert training. That's pretty frightening. And who have we got advising on tasers? Well, thanks again to a viewer who sent in this to uh, they've been listening to BBC Radio 4. There was a report on tasers, and we've said with help from tasers, uh, because one of the people speaking was a lady called Abby Diamond. And why are we interested in her? Well, let's just have a little look. Um, she's got an interdisciplinary PhD in research, criminology, sociology, law, quantitative, qualitative techniques from binary logistic progression to actor network theory. And um, no, don't laugh, Patrick, because this is serious stuff. And she's been exploring the use of the taser in England and Wales. Um, I hope everybody's with me so far. And um, if you're not sure where she might come from, if, as it were, uh, we can see here that she also received travel costs from, oh, Taser International between the 2nd and 8th of November to attend the annual conference uh, for the prevention of custody deaths. And she popped over to, oh, Scottsdale, Arizona, just down the road, I think. <laughs> I, I just find this amazing. This is how, so the, it's a corporate junket, basically, uh, run by the taser manufacturer yeah. to explore deaths in custody. I mean, what part of this? Uh, I don't know what to say. It, it, kind it, of speechless. It, it, right? yeah, you're speechless. <laughs> well, let's follow it through. We're laughing. But, of course, this is, this is a terribly serious subject. So if you go online, you can find more about the background of this lady. She's got connections in with all sorts of European organizations and NGOs. But I was fascinated to find the Amiga Research Foundation in here. Now, of course, everybody will be familiar with Amiga Research Foundation. If they're not, they should be, because here they are. They're an independent organization uh, looking at the use of really sort of weapons of torture by the police. And uh, let's bring in their work if we can. Here we are. Uh, so what are they doing? Monitoring the international military security and police trade in the pursuit of transparency and accountability. So never mind that Britain or America are torturing people in uh, Iraq, for example. This is an independent unit. And we just check it's independent. It's always good to have a look at the funding. And um, where's the funding come from? Oh, it's come from the European Commission under the European Instrument for Democracy, a uh, very democratic uh, EU, which is presumably why we've left, the Joseph Roundtree Charitable Trust, always behind the uh, good initiatives for humanity, uh, the Sigrid Rousing Trust. Uh, this is fascinating. This is, um, I think, a Danish lady who married a very wealthy gentleman involved in theatre and film, and they're now putting money in to make sure people don't get hurt by tasers. So we're, this is all looking good. And I didn't have time to look at the Oak Foundation. Mm -hmm. So um, police being armed with safe weapons that kill people. So this a Abby Diamond, I'll just quickly flash back to the last slide. So it seems like she's a functionary of the industry. Yes. Because at no point in here, I see lots of talk of actor network scenarios and studying all these the various nuances of what's going on. But where are the peer reviewed studies on the risks? Well, there was a doctor who did the major one who came from Birmingham Heartlands Hospital. I've spoken to him personally. And in his report, he said, well, basically, the tasers are safe apart from when they're not safe. But they're safe apart from. So they're okay. Occasionally they might not be. So they're okay until they're not okay. Yeah. Who paid for the report? Taser did. Taser did. So yeah. th th this is a fundamental problem of academia. This is the corporatization of academia yes. right here. You've just outlined it, Brian. The same with the full body scanners, which they have in airports that use millimeter microwave. Now, you've, we've had Pippa King, I believe, on, on this program uh, and also yeah. on my program talking about millimeter microwaves and some of the risks involved uh, on a cellular le level 
where are the peer-reviewed studies on the full-body scanners at airports? Are there any? No. There are not? So, so we're, we're human guinea, guinea pigs, basically. Yeah. A whole generation, millions of travelers a day, human guinea pigs. So this is what academia needs to be doing. This is what Abby Diamond should be doing, is looking at the risks. And is there a safety? Are there health risks? Is this being used properly instead yeah. of uh, being a functionary of the industry? Yeah. This is what we need well, people I, to do. I personally would say to anybody who's going to get involved with this, let yourself be tasered. Now, credit to the doctor when I challenged him and I said, have you actually been tasered? He said, yes, six times. Wow. And I said, and what was it like? And he said, well, the pain was exquisite. And I've, I've got to reveal that at that time, I didn't realize that exquisite pain was a medical definition. I was worried that uh, something else was at work there. But, <laughs> but uh, he said, yeah, he'd been tasered six times. And I thought to myself, what an idiot, uh, because we are now seeing the risk. You can drop dead. Mm. Yeah. And there we are on the back of fear and terrorism. Uh, we now have police who've got a weapon that can kill, but they're going to use it on children. Now, I owe you an apology, Patrick, because what I haven't got is the, um, is the slide to cover the Chinese satellite. But well, I, can, just, I can explain it for you. If right. You want. Just before I give you a few minutes to do that, I'd like to say that uh, we've just been informed that the Home Office has acknowledged receipt of the transcript of the Metropolitan Police whistleblower. So um, Amber Rudd is now in uh, possession of that transcript. Um, we are the 16th today. We will now wait to see how many days it takes the Home Secretary to respond on this probably most critical of all the information that's come forward about Westminster child abuse cover-ups. So from that to the Chinese. Well, uh, we don't have the slide, but China just launched an IT satellite. Uh, which is a quantum satellite. It's a guest system. Right. And this is basically the future of information technology. It's, so it's a, it's a quantum array system using lasers with entang quantum entanglement encryption on both ends. So this is a super secure satellite. It's totally innovative, completely yeah. proprietary. And so they plan to roll out a network of these receiving and uh, stations and maybe more satellites. So, uh, what I'm saying here, Brian, is China just passed the West yeah. in terms of one of the most important technological developments um, that you can possibly have, which is information technology. So, if people are still thinking that China is a backward country and yeah. there's sort of a Asian backwater, you really have to come and wake up now and understand what the global marketplace really is where the center of power is in terms of innovation, manufacturing, and the future. And I'll tell you, Brian, when you travel around Europe, and when you travel around uh, even North America, the majority of travelers that you see, tourists, they used to be Japanese and Americans. Guess what? Russians, probably. No, they're Chinese. Chinese. Chinese have the biggest middle class. They have disposable income. They will be running the world economy for the next 100 years. They have all the capital. If they pulled out of the world tourism market, it, right now, it, so many businesses would collapse. Right? So America played this role for the last 50 years, yeah. and now China is moving into this role. That, that's a reality. And I think there's a lot of people still in denial of this. And the fact is they do have disposable income. They have a middle class. It's right. huge. Uh, and they have buying power. And they're doing the R&D, and you're seeing these developments like this Coming quantum up. satellite. So. We're playing catch up now. Okay. Chinese. Right, Patrick, thank you very much uh, for taking us through those items. Uh, we're just about at the end of time. I would like to say uh, thank you very much to all of those viewers and listeners that pass in information to us. It's very valuable. Sometimes there's more than we can actually handle, but don't stop because very often you give us key parts of the jigsaw. Uh, what we're trying to do at the moment is, is really to show people uh, how the whole political and social and economic structure of UK is being taken apart from the inside. And of course, that includes now, as we, we're seeing, the destruction of the church. Uh, what's the aim of this to leave people completely rudderless in the face of uh, an increasingly chaotic si situation? 
So we've got uh, our own members of parliament to blame. That's where the rest lies. But of course, powerful figures behind the scenes pulling their strings and blackmailing them. Can we change it? Yes. Uh, how do we do that? We just need enough people to stand up and be counted and to say, no, we're not accepting it. Any last words? We've done about all we can do there. Okay. Thanks very much for joining us. We will be back at the same time tomorrow. Bye-bye.